is we've asked uh, the ESTF team, um, based on the findings of, of our test bed that we had earlier in the, uh, the year, and um, going over those findings and, and working it, it out with the, uh, the regional uh, union representatives of how we want to propose um, expanding the ESTF to the rest of the region. And we've made some changes uh, based on our discussions and certainly made some changes based on uh, the findings of the, 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 the testbed process. And so this is essentially to get you all up to date on what we're essentially um, be asking um, the offices to consider if they want to be part of the, uh, the expansion of the ESTF to the rest of the region. So I'm going to go through here. I, I heard that we've got a couple of testbed offices on the call, too, so it would be great if uh, they want to provide any information about how it went in their office if uh, some of the questions arise about the transition from to uh, operating under the uh, ESTF guidelines. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump in here. Um, my name is Chuck Greif. I'm the co-leader with Ted Funk of the, uh, the GMAT uh, ESTF team. Okay, the ESTF, um, as I'm sure you all know, stands for Enhanced Short-Term Forecast. And basically, uh, it's become pretty apparent that there's a strong need for enhancing our short-term forecast that we offer to the public. Um, and it, it's a, it is a tangible and necessary result of the weather services shift from criteria policy-based products to customer-centric impact-based DSS. We must be the ones to provide this accurate, detailed, and frequently updated decision support to the customers and partner base, particularly for the short term when weather conditions can always be considered high impact. Hourly gridded forecast information that is more detailed and relevant to and in tune with the ongoing expected short term weather is the number one request from our partners at the national level. The goals of the ESTF would be more frequent updates to the forecast. This is designed to more accurately reflect current conditions and expected synoptic mesoscale trends, updates to the near-term forecast at least every three hours, updates, to more, updates more frequently when conditions are changing, though, uh, jumping on upcoming forecast changes quicker as well. Also, more deterministic forecasts in the short term, hourly pop and weather grids, but these don't have to be changed or edited hourly. Uh, first 24 hours is, is what we're is what our goal is to have that covered and to better match the forecast to current observations from radar and satellite, mesonets, and the OBS database. Another important part is an improved presentation of our forecast on the web to take advantage of the higher detail that we will be providing within the grids. Um, this is to better highlight the short-term forecast, hourly weather graphics, and there's a few new web pages out there that um, take advantage of this, and particularly the new national page that has been implemented um, more um, completely or better displays the hourly weather graph, and it's easier to get to that information now because of that. Um, we also have a, a southern region has an experimental web page that they've developed, and we've had some input in, in their development of that, and several of the testbed offices are linking to that now. That has a pretty effective way of displaying our short-term weather information. In addition, there's a, a mobile.weather.gov app that uh, also can uh, effectively display some uh, near-term, uh, short-term, high-resolution, uh, higher-detailed weather information as well. Um, other forecast-related products that, we, uh, that, are, that are part of our, our, um, our process is an automation of the AFM and, and PFM. Um, ZFP streamlining, we have a team right now working on uh, coming up with a better way to, to deal with the ZFP and how it handles the uh, ESTF information and the, the greater uh, detail that is actually uh, put in those grids. And uh, one of the key things to that is that to keep the resolution set at no higher than uh, every six hours. And another uh, suggestion is to consider going to a um, one county, one zone type uh, um, ZFP issuance. And also we have a standardized AFD formatter that uh, all the test beds are using. And, and after a lot of uh, um, suggestions and, and comments and improvements, um, I, I think everybody's pretty happy with. OK, um, let's go into some of the comments we've gotten from our partners uh, coming out of the test beds. Um, Stu Foster mentioned to, uh, to me during one of our uh, presentations at our media workshop 
um, that he uh, frequently uses the hourly pops and weather graphs on our web pages to plan his activities, uh, and particularly mentioned going out to the ball games. Um, there in La Crosse, um, he's the forecasters I've talked to at Orchard Growers, and uh, the most important factor for him was uh, temperature and winds. And uh, when he was introduced to the hourly weather graphs, he loves them, and he stated he'll start using them. In Goodland, Farmer says he likes our weather graphs, and he checks them five times a day during the growing season, even in winter. And definitely, farmers are some of our most frequent customers there in Goodland. And Marquette, uh, utilizing the ESTF process, makes um, the forecaster more confident when speaking to the users about fire weather. Good Linda uh, from an EM school superintendent had asked him to keep an eye on weather for a ball game, and because of the hourly pops in their grids, he saw that there was only a slight chance for storms during the game, and but severe weather was expected afterwards. And he appreciated having that hourly pops to better understand what he was expecting. Um, in Louisville, uh, the Kentucky DOT explained to them that the hourly pop and weather data is very important. Uh, in Springfield, Missouri, DOT uh, used the hourly forecast for staffing before uh, big weather events. And some of the forecaster comments of forecasters who are in the test bed, um, Marquette um, uh, respond to us that the updates assist them in not turning their backs to the current weather, which may have happened in the past. And by keeping forecasts up to date, they gain the trust uh, of those utilizing it. Uh, St. Louis uh, added details that he would normally not have added to the grids. Um, Grand Rapids hourly resolution to pops and weather did a good job tracking and timing of precip as it moved through the CWA. Goodland, I uh, hope with the hourly weather pop grids, which they need to be doing, especially given their any channel you turn to doing so essentially, our competition. And time for us to get away from the six and twelve hour block pops, they said. Marquette says it's a huge advantage of ESTF uh, in previous Situations where it updated uh, the first period at most and waited until 4 p.m. for the rest. And now, uh, with the encouragement of, of jumping on things quicker, uh, it's especially helpful with all the contractor calls as well. And at, at JKL, uh, the updating, the ending, and clearing of precip uh, and, and the sky conditions um, really helped in assisting updating the tasks. And the forecaster thought they could really improve our services with it. And then, uh, some really good insight from um, Gaylord. Um, why do we mandate hourly? Because it sets an expectation that we should look for opportunities to add this level of detail when possible, knowing that sometimes it isn't possible, though. At Paducah, um, if hourly information is available, it actually cuts down on the number of phone calls into the office. And that forecaster is a strong believer that it's made a difference there at that office. Okay, so essentially uh, what we would be asking the offices to do who want to participate in the, the expansion of the ESTF, um, and essentially this has evolved from the original ESTF plan based on uh, feedback and experiences from the test beds, and I do have some details available on that if uh, people are interested in, in, in going over that. But uh, to boil it down to, in a nutshell, we're going to be asking that the offices update at least once every three hours uh, this would be the short-term uh, part portion of the forecast. And it can often be just as simple as matching the current OBS and satellite information um, via a procedure that we will provide. Other tools like Extrapolate that we provide will help to blend current conditions with the upcoming forecast. We also ask that there be more frequent updates when weather is changing, and this will be at forecaster discretion. And sometimes just the effective elements that are most changeable or relevant are, are the ones that we would like to see updated, um, particularly in a, a high impact situation or, or a, a severe weather situations. Maybe there is only time to, to focus on the pops or, or a wind field or something, but try to get those out and updated if, if all possible. Um, certainly the uh, warnings take priorities, but pretty high up on the priority list need to be somebody watching those grids and getting that information out to our, our users via our, our web and dissemination method. Okay, um, also spatial resolution and details. The short-term forecast uh, needs to be, strives to be more detailed with lines and gradients of weather showing up in the grids and uh, the forecast when appropriate and forecastable. 
I would like to see more zeros and 100% seen in the sky and pop grids, more deterministic uh, forecasting here. And this remains always at the forecaster's discretion. So we, we just trust the forecasters to put in what they think is going to happen, what, what their forecast is going to be, and, and not hold themselves back if uh, uh, by earlier practices or maybe trying to blend for the entire day. If you're focused on just a few hours um, of, of a transition coming through, you can hone in on that and not have it kind of washed out by the entire uh, span of 12 hours or six hours of what the, the kind of the, the standard practice had been. Okay, and finer details that change hourly are definitely encouraged, and the extrapolate interpolate procedures help help with this. We would like to see uh, the for the offices showing the trends in the data, and because those trends are what is most vital and effective to a uh, good DSS. Now, this again does not mean having to edit every single forecast hour, which is a common uh, misconception. There are definitely tools and, and methods to to alleviate this, and and often it's a as infrequent as editing every six hours and then interpolating or every, editing every three hours and interpolating, you can really get an effective and a forecast that the forecaster is uh, pretty happy with by doing that. Okay, uh, specifically the STF process, um, this is what we are proposing to the rest of the region, is uh, a lot of the, uh, the elements will stay the same. For instance, QPF snow amount ice accumulation, uh, max T, min T, will all stay what their standard default uh, values are. But uh, temperature, dew point, relative humidity, parent, temperature, wind, gusts, and sky will become hourly. Uh, most of those already are. I believe sky is uh, definitely flexible right now, but would like to see that hourly resolution. And then uh, pop and weather would become hourly for the current and pre-first period, the current pre-first period time frame, and then period one. Um, that is represented down below in the yellow uh, on the, the time scale there. So basically, on day shifts, whatever time it is on the day shift, you'll be forecasting, you'll be responsible for a higher resolution forecast up to uh, right, right before 12Z of the next day. So it essentially be the current period you're in and then the, that period one tonight period. And likewise, the evening shift will go uh, the tonight period and then through the next day period. And then during the night shift, you would have the current uh, period uh, heading into the early morning hours and then throughout the, the, the day period. Okay, um, now let's talk about how the hourly forecast, uh, how that, the hourly forecast information, how that um, tends to, to uh, have a, a pretty large impact on our users. So. Um, According, according to uh, pretty much all of our users, um, the uh, forecast information at the hourly level affects their decisions more often than watches and warnings, um, essentially because it happens every day. Every day they want to know when things are going to occur this afternoon or maybe later on tonight, whether you've got a rain event moving in, rain moving out, uh, thunderstorms developing, that, that kind of uh, thing, whereas we are highly focused and really intensely uh, dealing with situations when you're watching warning situation. But a lot of times for most offices that happens maybe 60 days out of the year, whereas the customers are focused on what's going on outside their window for the next uh, several hours and then well into uh, the next day. Um, and every day of the year they're, they're focused on that. And uh, kind of our philosophy for the ESTF is that our grid should reflect our phone briefings. Um, basically, a lot of times you get phone calls and, and you can tell somebody on the phone that kind of information of when the best timing is going to be of, of uh, precipitation chances or onset of snow or the, uh, the outbreak of thunderstorms. So in this, this example, a band of showers and thunderstorms will move into the area over the next hour after 9 a.m., last a few hours, then shift east of the area by early afternoon, around 2 p.m., with only isolated showers after that. Um, that would equate to a forecast of 80% pops late in the morning, decreasing to 20% by mid-afternoon and onward, with thunder indicated uh, through early afternoon only. 
Now, this kind of detail getting out to the, the mass of the public and not just the person who was uh, bold enough to call in or, or knew the, the right number to uh, talk to a forecaster it is available to the mass audience via our web and via our grids that, that we are, are able to put out there. And the key to this is the, the hourly grids and uh, showing that timing and trends and that, that ability to show that within the, the grids themselves. Okay, to delve a little deeper into that, um, the hourly weather graph really is the, one of the best means we have of providing that weather information to our customers. And so the customers can be asking questions such as how long, how long will heat index be 95 degrees today or higher, and they can see that within the, the curve. Um, if they're planning an outdoor event, uh, is the forecast better for them to do it in the morning or in the afternoon? That becomes a little more apparent in the uh, hourly weather graph. For how long will temperatures be? Um, less than 79 degrees Fahrenheit tonight, and when he may not need his AC running. Is there a time when winds will have more easterly component today rather than westerly? What are the rain chances for late day rush hour traffic? What are the best chances for lightning in the area today? What's the best two hour period when it's likely to be dry outside so they can accomplish an outdoor task? And there are just a myriad of different questions that people could ask, and some you'd never even expect. For instance, uh, we heard back from uh, the office that have been doing this kind of stuff in Eastern Region in, in uh, Boston that they were kind of surprised how important to one of the utility companies uh, up there their sky cover was, their sky grids, because they, the utility companies would use that information to help gauge when they're going to need more resources available because if sky cover increased above a certain threshold, then that's when a large number of the people in the area would start turning on their lights, and they have to be prepared for that. And so a lot of people tend to put sky cover down as a, a lower level grid, but at least for the folks at the utility company there in the, the northeast, they uh, view those pretty, pretty importantly. Okay, and essentially um, when we get down to the idea of hourly pops versus 12-hour or 6-hour pops, um, just some of these, these graphs try to uh, hone in on the, the exact differences and the exact benefit of those. Um, compared to each other. So if somebody was asking if a midday outdoor event would be rained out by looking at the various levels of pop guidance that we give them, um, if they're just looking at 12-hour pops, they would assume it would be. Um, if they're looking at the 6-hour pop, it could be. And then at the 1-hour pop, they would realize that, no, at noon or, or 1, 1 p.m., really there's very little chance of, uh, of uh, a rain, uh, raining amount. Now, if somebody asks when rain is most likely to occur today, they would, be, they would have to almost assume that it would be all day with a 12-hour and after 2 p.m. with a 6-hour, and then definitely refined to between 3 and 5 p.m. with the 1-hour pops. And again, someone asking when rain chance would be 20% or less, they could only refine that really well with the 1-hour pops and know that before 12 p.m. and after 10 p.m. is their best chance for less than a 20% chance. And someone asking how chances how rain chance this morning will compare to the chance of the evening, they can get a, uh, a relative uh, a viewing of it and a more accurate viewing of it only via the hourly pops. And say an outdoor plan event planner want to know when the period of, of time when rain chances would locally exceed 50% today, um, it becomes pretty clear uh, in the hourly pop that it's between 3 and 6 p.m., where it's a little more muddled with the 6-hour. They just know it's kind of in the afternoon. And then uh, during the 12 hour, it would almost have to be assumed that it's all day. So the point here is that different answers um, could definitely yield different decisions for them, and uh, the detail that we put in will help facilitate their better decisions. Now, a lot of question, one of the main questions we get when we, we talk about going hourly with our POPs is do we have the skill to provide an accurate hourly forecast detail? And I guess that depends on um, what skill we are measuring. Skill in precisely indicating where and when rain will occur is limited. And this is due, of course, to the skill set of the data sets, the skill limit and the data sets that we have available. Now, but skill in supporting dis better decision-based answers is considerable. We can distinguish between periods of widespread rain, periods of isolated showers. We can distinguish between aerial extent of precipitation uh, 
sample gradients, starting, ending times. We can distinguish between periods of greater and lesser thunderstorm activity and between nights when the low temperature might briefly reach 32 degrees versus nights where the temperatures will be at or below 32 for a greater or equal to six hours. We can show far greater detail than we could solely with the text zones or the nowcast. It's the detail that supports, it's this detail that supports uh, good decision making. And it also gives the forecaster a means to show what they expect, how these, they expect these weather events to evolve. It allows us to provide more information to the public and really get our thoughts out to them in a much more effective way. Okay, now I've got an example here of creating hourly pop pops. Um, essentially, this is a f four six-hour blocks uh, going to the, the, the standard way of doing it, where you would make your six-hour blocks. And the same would apply, of course, if you did 12-hour blocks. You just have two 12-hour blocks. But at six-hour blocks, you'd create four separate images, and th that would be the result. And the forecast would be pretty happy with that. And if you look on this image at the l lower uh, right-hand screen, that's kind of how it would look in the hourly weather graph, would be uh, straight lines across for those six-hour periods. Now, if you wanted to go hourly, and you put these gaps in, and you just drew an hour, and you created an hour every six hours, and then drew something similar. And I'm not going to show you all the various uh, uh, grids that those would be. Um, essentially, if you did uh, six or four hourly pops at six hour uh, increments with the gaps in there, it would be about the same amount of time as creating the four six hour block ones. And the, the key to this now would be to take that information that you've done hourly and then interpolate it with the interpolate tool. And uh, the extrapolate tool can work similarly, but using the standard interpolate tool that we all have in GFE, it would interpolate the gaps in between. And the result of that would be a, a much smoother line curve uh, running through the, this uh, this forecast and provide that level of detail when people can really understand when the best chances are going to be for the uh, for the, the particular uh, weather event. And to look at those the differences up close, we can see that uh, the uh, the more smoother and step-by-step and -step timing and trend uh, uh, forecast is, is provided by the hourly pops and uh, uh, to a much greater extent than the six-hour blocks. And that effort really was not that much more. The time involved was just basically the extra step of running the interpolate tool. And that happened. That really takes very little time at all to run. Um, one of the tools that the uh, ESTF team will provide, and this is kind of the standard tool that you start every ESTF update, one of your three hourly updates with, would be the uh, data load and blend procedure. And uh, essentially, it will take the OBS database. And then of your choosing, um, the, whether you want to just populate it from the OBS database up to that current hour, and then blend that in some manner into the current, the existing forecast. So if you've already gone and edited your forecast the way you like it, you can then blend the, the current conditions into the, the current forecast using this procedure. And you have a choice of populating and initializing with uh, nothing at all, the OBS database, the uh, RTMA or, or LAPS data. And then you can also use some LAMP elements to, to, get, to get some, uh, take advantage of the, uh, the science and, and algorithms that are involved with the LAMP and, and get some uh, more quality uh, model information into, into your, your upcoming forecast. And you have the flexibility of how far you want to allow the forecast to blend into the, uh, the current data that you've just loaded and whether you're using LAMP or whether you're not using LAMP. And this uh, certainly has the uh, ability to be revised should we get more models that we want to uh, have as an option. And this is kind of going to be the, the main uh, procedure that you'll use to jumpstart the update of the forecast. And having uh, our team available to constantly monitor whatever new model fields come, come around and what other ideas people might have. We can keep this tool standard, keep the procedure standard, and, and update that with uh, any advancements that we, as a, as a team, come across. In addition to that population and blending process that takes place in the, uh, 
the, the grids to the top, the temp dew point, max and mins, and uh, RH and wind. It also um, will check uh, your pop-in sky for hourly resolution. Now, this is based on only checking. It does highlight it green, but it is only checking those grids. So if you've got some six hours or three hour blocks um, out beyond when, uh, or out toward when the, uh, the, the, the ESTF is to be in effect, it will take those and just fragment them. It's not gonna change the data, just fragment them. So anything it fragments becomes the exact same value for those each hour. Okay, and um, John Gagan wanted me to show a quick example of the extrapolate procedure because that's one of his favorites. So here's a pretty basic extrapolate example. Um, step one is so you want to draw a weather, an area of weather moving through. Um, in, in general, when you draw from scratch, um, a lot, uh, having the white space around a weather feature tends to work best. But then you, once you have that drawn, you then will draw will run the tool, highlight an area as far as you want to, to run that over, how many hours you want to run that. And you have the options within the tool to uh, move that feature now via a source of, of model source or uh, user entered one down below. Um, and if you're using a model source, you can actually choose the wind level you want to use and the, uh, and the, uh, the layer of wind you want to use. There's also an option to create a swath, which will create a path behind what you move, which is particularly helpful if you're moving pops and, and you want to keep, make sure that your hourlies don't have gaps if it's a fast moving feature. And uh, at the midsection of the, the, t the procedure here, you can uh, choose which, how much speed you want to put it in, uh, what direction you want to move it from, and which, if you want to move it toward the uh, area or move it from. So uh, depending on what uh, tool you're using on AWIPS perhaps to figure out um, which direction the features are moving, uh, you can uh, select the, the direction of movement accordingly. Uh, but that only is in use if you're not using a different source, the model source. If you are using the observed, that takes effect down here. And there's also an option to, to not move it at all. So if you just want a feature that's gonna uh, fade out or, or enhance itself, you can just leave the movement uh, uh, as none, and um, down below you can see we have an option where you can backfill with the original data, or uh, can use uh, data from the very edge of, of the model. Um, if you're using the forecast or the model, we we'll use the edge data and just drag that across. Um, also, you can just backfill it with zeros if you're inclined to do that as well. Um, it gives you an option too of the diminishment rate, so you can have features that start to fade out, and also. It, it gives you ability to blend it now with uh, the, the various databases. You can blend with the official database or blend with your forecast, your upcoming forecast. And based on that, you can decide if you want to have it blended at all. If you don't want it blended at all, it just do none and overwrite what is in the, the uh, for upcoming forecast. If you want to average it out, you can average it. If you want to just take the lower values of the two or the higher values, we'll do that. Um, you can add or subtract as well. And then there's a safe mode built in, so if you, you can go ahead and select that yes, and if uh, somehow it doesn't do what you want to do, you can just quickly uh, run this again with a restore option. It'll, it'll re plug those right back in that you just uh, saved off before you ran the procedure. And then finally, there's an option to run some smoothing all built into the procedure um, after you're done, um, after it's done moving the feature. So the example of that in this, this example is um, you run the tool with those settings I had set there, and it just essentially slides that through at a, a pretty steady pace. Okay, now I do have a more advanced uh, example available if, if we have time, if people are interested. But let's move on to uh, what we uh, provide for the web, that the enhanced short-term forecast on the web. Um, we're all familiar with the hourly graphs. Um, this is certainly more prominent on the point and click pages now than it had been in the past. And so now it's easier for our customers to get to and are easier for our customers to see. Um, the activity planner is there on, on most people's web pages and, and uh, easy to link to. And it, this is pretty nice that it allows the, forecast, uh, the uh, customer to decide what kind of elements they're most interested in and able to, to set up a, the, the, the guidance and, and whatever parameters they're, they're looking for and it can highlight areas when that, that
that uh, event is predicted to occur. And that helps them plan their activities as well. Um, and then, of course, the point-and-click forecast, um, the better uh, point-and-click tends to do pretty well reflecting the details in there. Sometimes it still gets a little too wordy. Um, and, but this is a, a, another main way that a lot of people get our forecast. Okay, um, this is the, the Southern Region Experimental Web page I had alluded to. And um, a lot of test beds are using this. Um, you can see here it, it's got the hourly data and it's hourly changing forecast. So at that level, people can choose to, uh, to see how the next few hours are going to pan out based on our forecast. It's got a prominent display of the uh, hourly weather graph. And um, one of the, the key concepts here is it's a, a drill up concept where you start down at the, at the the near term where you're really talking about the next few hours, and then people can click to go further out if they want to know 24-hour data and see it more the next uh, few, several days, all the way out to a seven-day forecast, which is more like a standard um, point-and-click type forecast that's displayed on our, our main pages. So um, some specifics um, highlighted here would be the weather stories found across the top. It's got a, uh, you can get another forecast here. Um, um, this one, you got the current radar loop, and now if you actually click anywhere in here, it will re-identify uh, where you're at and change the forecast based on that, based on our, our grids. Uh, this is really neat. It's got a slide cast feature that, that as you slide this bar across, it will update your, your conditions down below, and you can see what how things change based on the forecast as you slide that bar there. Um, there's the hourly weather graph, and it also has a little tab down here where you can click it and become... Uh, uh, tabular. Actually, the tabs right here. You can click it and make it into a tabular forecast if you want the the, the more raw numbers of it. Uh, it has a link to our, our our Facebook page, and it has a current weather from uh, from wherever the uh, the, the uh, your your office is located or wherever the nearest um, uh, ASOS to that to that point. Um, also. Some of you guys are, are, I'm sure, aware of the, the mobile forecast application we have now. Here's an example out of Paducah, who was a test bed site. And in particular, you can see they've got a real nice uh, uh, ramp up of uh, conditions here. Um, we're um, going from clear skies to a slight chance of rain and building up um, to about 70% chance of rain um, by uh, midday there. OK, um, the ESTF. It, is offering a lot of assistance with this. Uh, they, the, our team, uh, as part of the, the GMAT, um, we are offering a suite of, of new smart tools and procedures. That data load and blend procedure I, I showed you, um, an enhanced extrapolate procedure, and um, also the probability of weather tool that uh, Andy Just has worked on. And this was a tool that's been recommended by the test beds. So we'll offer support for that, offer everything you need for that, and. Uh, Get offices up and running on that if they if they want to uh, work with that that uh, weather tool that whole weather methodology. Um, we also have a SharePoint support page. The, on there, there's a discussion board, um, a repository of all the training presentations and any additional ones we we will come up with. Uh, this will be a resource of sharing ideas and techniques among other forecasters and offices. Um, and any other training links that we come across that might be relevant to uh, performing the ESTF and um, putting that enhanced detail into the grids. Also, we will provide uh, periodic reviews and updates and assessments from, from the, the GMAT team and uh, helping to, to guide the project. And we'll be responsive to the forecasters and offices with whatever uh, questions or suggestions that they might have to how, whatever we can do to help make this as, as smooth as possible and as effective as possible, a means of getting our weather information out to the public. Um, in the future, we're looking for adding the, the, the con short, which is very similar to what was done with the, the cons all. Um, taking the, all the short-term model information and guidance that's available and blending it into a, another option to populate with. And um, our, our folks, the folks in Milwaukee really put together um, some, uh, a lot of good effort into getting this to work so that the gaps are filled and that it's every hour is blended with something. And you can populate directly from this 
if you want in a sensible way, or you can use it as, as guidance and, and however the forecasters choose to, to take advantage of that. So that will be, that'll be forthcoming uh, shortly. Um, Boise Short is a kind of uh, Boise Verify, but designed more for the short term. Um, it will track the hourly stats of the official forecast and compare that to the odds database. It will also help you pick out uh, a better performing models, and it will give you a, a stats email and a, a web page that you can uh, keep track of that uh, on, on your intranet, uh, much like you're already doing most likely with the uh, Boise Verify uh, 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 stuff to begin with. Also, uh, we have some new population and blending tools in the works. And these are designed to take advantage of the, the new con short uh, guidance and any other short-term guidance that comes on. Um, definitely all the, the tools that we have will remain uh, um, under, under assessment. So any, kind of, any ideas for improvements, any suggestions from the field, any ideas for new tools can uh, come through us. And, and uh, we can see about building that or, or working with the developer to come up with a tool and then uh, get it all the kinks worked out, get some good documentation, and then spread that out to the rest of the, uh, the, uh, the region. Um, likewise, the, uh, the probability of weather um, tool methodology uh, will be con continue to be upgraded and supported. And um, any, any other ideas um, guided through the, the EFTF team um, based on the experiences and suggestions uh, that come forth from this project. Okay, I'd like to acknowledge the ESTF test beds. Um, in the north around the lakes, we had Marquette, Gaylord, Grand Rapids, and Detroit. Um, out in the mountains and to the plains areas, we had Grand Junction, Goodland, and Dodge City. And then coming across out of the uh, Missouri Valley into, uh, through Kentucky and into eastern Kentucky, we had uh, St. Louis, Paducah, Louisville, and Jackson. And all the forecasters helped out a lot with uh, with this whole project. And, I appreciate, we all appreciate their, their patience and their understanding and their, uh, their definitely goodwill and their efforts toward uh, making this work. It, uh, it's got off to a, a little tricky start and had to um, help come up with ways of better describing what we wanted to do and, and come up with uh, better ways to make it work effective. But probably about by the, the uh, fourth or fifth week into it, everybody was pr rolling pretty well and was pretty comfortable with, with doing the ESTF, and um, we do appreciate all their efforts. Also, um, we'd like to uh, thank uh, Pete Wolf, Sue at Jackson, um, Florida, Jacksonville, Florida, who uh, helped provide some of the, the uh, ideas to, uh, to us for this uh, presentation.